Good afternoon and thank you very much indeed for joining us. I mean, for the last 10 or so years, you have heard about the universal health coverage. This is a project by the government to ensure that, um, you know, all Kenyans, regardless of their financial status, they have access to quality and low-cost health care services. I mean, the journey has been tedious. And where we are now, we are at the implementation stage. Guess who is joining us in studio? We have Dr. Timothy Olweni. He's the chair of the Social Health Authority. He's going to take us through the um, universal health coverage and what SHA is doing to enhance um, UHC here in Kenya. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Ali, for joining us here. Uh, where are we in terms of uh, implementation of UHC? Well, UHC, as you know, is, uh, has got three facets. It's got um, the aspect of increasing access to quality, to healthcare services. Mm -hmm. They have got to be of sufficient quality to be effective. And again, people have got to be able to access those services without experiencing financial hardship. So there's a component of financial risk protection. Um, in fulfillment of its mandate as the government, the government uh, launched this UHC initiative. And the objective is to be able to achieve UHC. So social health authority as a body is supposed to be one of the vehicles that we use for realization of that goal. Very good. I, I mean, I, I know this is a journey that has been, you know, long. We've been talking about... Um, ensuring that um, you know all Kenyans you know, they have access to high quality um, health services you know without breaking their bank account um, and the journey has been long and it has seen you know it has evolved with the time up to the point where now we we, we, we now have the social health authority where do you fit in the UHC matrix well Social health authority is supposed to be a financier for healthcare services. Just like its predecessor, NHIF, NHIF was, was constituted in 1966 and has evolved over time to be able to meet the needs of the different times that it's, been, it's, come, it's come through. However, because of the, the design of NHIF, there are certain inefficiencies which were there in the system and there are certain needs which it was not able to meet. And that's the reason why it became necessary for us to transform this. For example, um, there has been in, uh, an, an excessive emphasis on curative treatment. So in other words, it simply put, it means we wait for people to get sick mm -hmm. and then we take care of them. That is not a very cost-effective way of being able to take care of the healthcare needs of a population. Mm -hmm. So now there's a tendency to try and move that further down and go to preventive and promotive care. That's the reason why we've got a primary health care fund which has been formed to be able to take care of primary health care needs. Mm -hmm. It first of all makes sure that people uh, those who are who, people who are healthy are helped to stay well. Those who become unwell go into the curative arm, and those who, for whatever reason, have got uh, health needs that cannot be treated but can be managed, they go. They are taken care of in terms of chronic illness. And those who, unfortunately, their illnesses are not curable for whatever reason, or they have reached the end of their lives, then they are also taken care of. So, in this new dispensation, we have got three different funds. We've got the primary health care fund, which I have to make clear did not exist before. Mm -hmm. so these are funds which are provided by the exchequer, and that's an additional component which is not there in the current dispensation under the NHIF. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, there's emergency chronic and critical illness fund. That fund also didn't exist before. The reason why it was constituted is because constitutionally it is a right for everybody to be able to access emergency health care services. Yeah. And those emergency health care services were not being funded before, so now we've got a fund that's supposed to take care of that. In addition, we have got people who had exhausted their benefits under the under the contributors fund, which is the National Health Insurance Fund, mm -hmm. the equivalent now is the Social Health Insurance Fund. So if you exhaust those benefits, you're supposed to again be moved on to access additional benefits. So when people talk about why not just keep NHIF, I want it to be clear that when we are, we are keeping the NHIF component in the Social Health Insurance Fund, yep. enhancing it, but in addition, we're introducing two new funds which didn't exist before. I mean, you know, the Americans will tell you that um, if it ain't broken, don't try to fix it. What was the problem with um, National, ha National Health Insurance Fund? The National Health Insurance Fund was working, right? Yeah. Pretty well. Mm -hmm. But it had its shortcomings. Yeah. And everybody who is in this country at the moment knows that it is not providing sufficient financial risk protection. There are still too many people who have to fund the health care out of pocket. It is estimated, for example, as of a few a year or two ago, that our total, our total health expenditure was 550 billion Kenya shillings. 
of that component, believe it or not, about 150 billion was being funded out of pocket, which means people dig into their savings, people contributing through Harambe's and so on. That is the component we need to eliminate because it is not an efficient way to be able to provide healthcare services because we want healthcare services to be pre-financed. Mm -hmm. At the point of service, it shouldn't be that you're paying for the care. So you get insurance, pay for, the, pay for your premium in advance, and then access service without financial difficulty at that time when you need to access the service. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the problems. But again, if you talk about the contribution structure for NHIF, NHIF was designed originally to be a contributor's fund for those in formal employment. Over time, we have tried to include the, those in not informal employment. That is the largest percentage of the people whom we have got under the National Health Insurance Fund. Now. However, the contribution that they were giving was a flat rate of 500 shillings, which was inequitable because it was regardless of your ability to pay. And then again, there was erratic contributions because people only contributed when they assumed they were going to need to access the fund. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that is not equitable because you cannot have a sustainable fund in that. And that's why a lot of the financial challenges that were there within NHIF go back to this contribution structure. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the new dispensation, this has tried to be fixed so that we have got everybody in formal employment contributing a certain percentage of their income but in addition to that we have got those who are not in formal employment or those who, whose income is not from salary employment contributing to the extent that they should because in the past what we had was everybody was paying 500 shillings whether you you earned a billion shillings a month a million shillings a month mm -hmm. or 500 shillings a month you are required to contribute 500 shillings a month if you want to see how unfair that is if you earn 500 shillings a month and your premium is 500 shillings a month that's 100 percent of your earnings yeah which is not even realistic, okay? Same if you add 5,000 5, 5, to 10%, whereas the person who was earning 100,000 shillings and above, 100,000 was contributing only 1.7%. So what we're trying to do is level that playing field so that everybody pays their way and we have a fund in which everybody can be able to contribute to the extent they can, everybody benefits, and then we eliminate the out-of-pocket expenditure. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, in your previous life, you used to be the chairperson of the Kenya Private um, Hospitals Association. Correct. And... and, and, and you used to be very critical of, um, you know, even the, how the National Housing, uh, National Health Insurance Fund was being managed. Yes. Even uh, remittances to private hospitals was a big challenge. Yes. And now you've been given the mandate of ensuring that um, the social health uh, uh, authority, you know, implement this agenda of uh, a universal health coverage. How are you going to do this to avoid the mistakes that you used to decry in the past? A lot of it, if you ask me, has already been taken care of in the design. Mm -hmm. In the design, like I said, sustainability was a big problem, and that's why the payments could not come through. So we've designed it in such a way that you've got a sustainable scheme mm -hmm. where everybody's contributing, and contributing regularly. Secondly, we have got a, a, a situation where we have got the care spread across diff different funds. Part of the load has been taken care of by the exchequer and the government. So mm -hmm. government is fulfilling its mandate in terms of being able to provide health care as it is in our constitution. Mm -hmm. So government is disbursing funds. So for example, the funds that the government disburses are supposed to also significantly reduce the aspect of, of financial, of uh, out-of-pocket expenditure. So there are a lot of things that are already taken care of in terms of the design. So it is supposed to be a more sustainable scheme as we go forward. But in addition to that, it's supposed to be a scheme where we can be able, and therefore we can be able to make payments and make remittances. So we promise, we deliver what we promise, and so we, we keep our promise in terms of sustaining the payments. And that's why I think the healthcare system will become more robust because with the injection of the capital inflows into the health sector, it is going to provide more employment. It's going to mean that we're going to have more supplies in our facilities. It's going to mean people can be able to access better quality health, health services and so on. How are you dealing with... Um the pending bills owed to private hospitals and even government hospitals by NHIF? Well, the pending bills is the thorny issue. And uh, of course, we have to be alive to the realities, the economic realities within which we live. At the moment, we've got a lot of pending bills and uh, we are still making efforts, especially from central government, to be able to remit amounts that are owed to NHIF. Mm -hmm. so that NHIF now, how much is this? Um, the current pending bills are a large amount. It's to almost to the tune of 30 billion shillings. 30 billion shillings? Yes. Oh, good Lord. And you're going to inherit? Yes, unfortunately that we, we are going to inherit, <laughs> but the, the truth of the matter is, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, as long as those bills are tabulated properly, mm -hmm. the accounts are reconciled, and the amounts are handed over to us, in, so we are going to pay only genuine bills. That has to be clear. Mm -hmm. All right? And we have got a transition committee which is in place, 
which also had got the mandate of being able to verify all the assets, liabilities, and so on of NHIF and hand them over to the Social Health Authority. Their term expired a short while ago. They just gave the report yeah. to us actually the day, the day before yesterday. Yeah. And so we that want to... on Wednesday. Yes. Mm. And so we want to be able to see what that report contains. Mm -hmm. And then, but at the end of the day, the assurance that we've got to give to providers is that any bills that are pending that are genuine will be settled because the Social Health Authority inherited all those liabilities as well, just as they did the assets. Mm -hmm. And just like we also need to transfer mm -hmm. a lot of the staff after going through a mm -hmm. process. Yeah, I know the report was handed over to you on Wednesday. Yes. And so um, it's, it's a bulky document yes. uh, that you have to go through so that uh, you ensure that um, you implement what is contained in that document. Yes. Do, do you want to give us some highlights of that report? Well, the, the mandate of the committee was fairly straightforward. One, they were supposed to verify all the assets. Mm -hmm. And the asset verification has been done countrywide for the entire uh, National Health Insurance Fund. This was done in conjunction with a multidisciplinary team from different arms of government, including the National Treasury. We had got people from the Ministry of Health, from NHIF itself, uh, Ministry of Land. So any area where they could be able to co-opt expertise that is required, that was done. So that report is being given in terms of the assets. In terms of the liabilities, again, it's an issue of tabulation. Ta liabilities, the biggest liabilities we have in terms of number mm -hmm. is, of course, with the healthcare providers because that's our mandate. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, healthcare providers are such a large number in this country that that's a process that cannot be completed and to even complicate things further, as we try and settle old bills, new ones are being incurred every day because it's not one of those where we can stop. Mm -hmm. So it's a continuous process and it's something that we're going to have to keep monitoring. And as funds come in, the only assurance we have is the Social Health Authority in the new dispensation and also in terms of the Act is not even in, allowed to invest funds. So we've got no interest mm -hmm. in holding any funds. Mm -hmm. Any funds that come are dispersed to providers as and when they come. Mm -hmm. So. That is uh, an ongoing process. In addition to that, there's also in terms of employee transition, there's going to be an advisory in terms of how to transit employees. The Act says that all NHIF staff will have to reapply apply for positions with the Social Health Authority. So once we have got our organizational structure approved and we've got our, all our human resource instruments, mm -hmm. then we can be able to recruit competitively. It will be open, but priority will still be given to NHIF staff because the assumption is, and this is actually true, they are the ones with the requisite expertise because they've been in this healthcare financing space for the longest time. Mm -hmm. So they have to get priority. And you know, we, we cannot take lightly. Nobody's going to lose a job, and that is the objective. Even those who are not absorbed are going to end up being either transited into other arms of public service, or those who opt to retire will have their benefits uh, done in the normal manner. Now, how many employees do you have? We have 1,745 or so. 1,745? Yes, at the National so Health Insurance Fund. At the National Health Insurance Fund? Yes. Those who are in post at the moment, yes. Wow. And all of them, you know, you know, as the Act says, I mean, they have to reapply for their positions. Correct. And for those who do not qualify, mm. you're saying they have to be absorbed. In fact, the term is not to say reapply for their positions. Mm -hmm. They will apply for positions within the Social Health Authority. It might not even necessarily be the same position. They've got the option to it's apply for the CEO's job if you feel you're qualified for mm -hmm. it, isn't it? But you can also reapply for your position that you are holding. A position previously. similar to what you are holding previously. Because, mm -hmm. the, like I said, this is a new establishment structure. Mm -hmm. So it's like you leaving one job and going to another. Mm -hmm. You can apply for a position similar to the one you're holding. Mm -hmm. If you say reapply for the position, it implies that it's the same organization. It is not. Mm -hmm. The National Health Insurance Fund and the Social Health Authority are different, uh, two different bodies. Entities. Yes. Despite the functions being the same, they are different. Its mandate is a little wider, so there are a lot of things that are different. How are the workers um, dealing with that? It's not easy. You know, any time that you feel your job is in jeopardy or at risk, it causes anxiety. And that is natural, all right? And how are you dealing with that? It is not easy because you have, go you, you have got to keep giving reassurance. You have got to provide the support. And this is a, at a time when, uh, of course, also economically, we are having a lot of... Uh, financial difficulty in this country and you know with every single job that is potentially in jeopardy you have got a lot of people there's a spouse there's a family there's an extended family who depend on this so it's not a matter that we're going to take lightly it has to be done it's a process that has to be done fairly it is a process where we have also got to get the best people for the job because for us to succeed as social health authority we've got the best people for the job Again, in terms of um, management and administration, we're going to be a heavily digitized organization. That's the plan. So, of course, we are, we are going to be more, more technology-driven, and that is also something that is useful because it means it makes us more efficient. And we have to be more lean because we, have, we want most of the resources that we get to go towards 
healthcare needs of the population as opposed to administrative costs. So we have to be lean and efficient. Mm -hmm. So you have got to balance all these objectives. We're trying to do a certain thing. We're trying to do it better. But again, you've got to look at that human component because the human component, you can never, you can never uh, downplay it because behind every job that is there at NHIF now, there are real people, there are real families who are depending on it. Yeah. So I'll be the last person who will say that we're going to take it lightly and we're just going to say we're going to get rid of people. It has been guaranteed even in the Act, nobody's going to be fired, so to speak. It's nobody a question of whether you're fired. going to be within the Social Health Authority or you're going to be in a different arm of government or you're going to opt to exit on your own and in terms of your benefits, that is clearly regulated within our, within our systems. Well, the Act is mm. very clear that um, no one is going to be fired. Yes. The Act is not also clear mm. that everyone is going to be absorbed. Yes, that is true. And so, in the process, the people who are likely to lose their positions. I've, I want you to get it clearly. Mm -hmm. The entire complement of people, save for those who have got, for, for example, some serious disciplinary issues, all right, or people whose qualifications are not legitimate, and there are a few of those. I'm sure there are. It's a process that is going on. But save for that, if somebody is, has been working at the National Health Insurance Fund, if they are not absorbed, if they are not fit for purpose, or if pos for possibly we take less than we have at the NHIF because of this aspect of efficiency, then they will go to other arms of public service, and they are going with some of those who might opt to retire, and that is the choice that they have. Mm -hmm. But there's nobody who is going to lose a job, so to speak. If somebody exits from the job, it will be all on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. There has been allegations in the past that um, NHIF you know, has a bloated workforce. Mm -hmm. And there has been calls in the past that uh, it is high time that uh, the services of NHIF now shall is uh, 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 handled technologically. So there will be a lot of um, technological optimization in, in, in the way you, you, you deal with your services or, or the services that you offer. So there will be a lot of technological adoption within it. And we know that, um, you know, when technology is involved, uh, you know, are, there must be some casualties along the process. And so these are the people that you are saying that are likely to be absorbed in, in other government institutions. Mm -hmm. Is that confirmed? My, my, first of all, my, my understanding is the objective of digitization or digital transformation mm -hmm. is not to make people lose jobs. It is to improve efficiency. It is to enhance efficiency. Mm -hmm. To enhance efficiency and more importantly for me, for more accountability, to be able to reduce fraud and so on. If anybody loses a job, it is a side, a byproduct or a side effect of that. That is number one. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I've always been of the opinion that technology cannot replace humans. But humans who don't embrace technology will be replaced. Human beings who fail to embrace technology must be. Will be replaced, right? <laughs> so I want people to be clear on that objective. So the objective here, I don't want people to view it like, oh, we are bringing up technology so that people can lose jobs. No, we want it to be efficient. We have actually not determined in terms of mapping and, and process mapping. Mm -hmm. That is some of the processes that are going through now because we are saying this is the old process. This is the new one. Let us map it. What has been digitized? Are there any jobs that are lost as a consequence? That is how we come up with our new structure in terms of the establishment structure and say this is the number we need. Now, anybody above that, then we have to say, where do they go? The law says they go into other arms of public service. So that is the option that they have. Uh, it might very well be that you've got somebody who feels I've worked here long enough. You know what? Mm -hmm. It's time for me to do something else. I don't feel like going to public service. Or might even say I, I don't even need to go into this uh, social health authority arrangement. I feel like I need to rest. That is an option that they have, and that is an option they had, if you ask me, regardless of whether we're transforming this to the social health authority mm -hmm. or not. Look, I, I mean, you're talking about an institution that has a workforce of about 1,700 and? And 45, yes. And, 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 and yeah, 45. Around there. When you look at SHA, hmm. are you likely to have that huge number of workforce? No, we're not going to have a workforce that huge. The question is how much less. That's a question and that's I what I'm saying. Ask. And that's what I'm saying. That's where we have got our HR instruments. You know, we've got a, a whole team of professionals from different arms of government. It was mm -hmm. not done by social health authority alone. Mm -hmm. It was done in conjunction with the NHIF staff, with the Public Service Commission, people from SRC. So there's a whole team from the social, State Corporations Advisory Commission and so on. There's a whole team of professionals who worked on it. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who come up with the HR instruments. But there's a process of approval. It's being looked at the Public Service Commission again. They will look at it and say, you know what, based on what these guys recommended, we think you need to adjust it this way. When that number comes out, 
then is when now we come back as and a now chair of shop yes what number are you looking at of workforce i've told you it's not for me to determine for me as an end user all i say is this is what i need done mm -hmm. and then they tell me this is the number of people that you need bare minimum to be able to get this done oh, i don't want to have a bloated workforce you're going to have the number that you need so you optimize it so there are professionals working on it that number will become apparent very soon when we start recruiting and it'll be public knowledge and even the staff will know but it would be premature at this stage for me to say this is the number of people we're going to take because um, it is not going to be accurate. Mm -hmm. When do you plan to start the recruitment process? The moment our HR instruments are approved, and we are, we are looking at possibly in the next few weeks. In the next few weeks? Yes. So it has to be within the, maybe next month or something? Yes, it has to be because you know also the NHIF's mandate expires on the 21st of November mm -hmm. this year. And so 22nd of uh, December, I mean so November. I, yeah, ideally. But of course, you know, processes never work. And especially if you're starting a new state corporation, doing something this huge, there are always going to be delays. But uh, if you ask me, between doing something on time and doing it right, if I could do have both, I'll take both. But if it's be, uh, be, between, I've had to choose between doing something right and doing it on time, mm -hmm. I'll take doing it right. You know, as a chairman um, of, um, any, any, I mean, you're the first chairman of... Uh, You'd be classified as the founding chairman of the, the Social Health uh, Authority. Authority. Uh, and, and, and so you have a lot of responsibility to birth and nurture this kid that is SHA uh, and ensure that um, you, know, you lay a proper and a firm foundation for the growth of this baby. Uh, when you're talking to the employees of, um, uh, 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 I don't know whether to call it NHIF or okay. SHA, yes. uh, uh, when they know for sure that at some point, um, you know, the, 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 their jobs, you know, they are hanging in, you know, in the balance. What do you tell them? All I can do is reassure them that, you know, there's going to, there's, I know there's a lot of anxiety, and we assure them that it's going to be fair, and we tell them the Has outcomes. Has it affected um, a delivery of service? Of course it affects productivity a little bit. That is, that is natural. Mm. That it affects productivity a little bit, but of course we keep trying to reassure them, and uh, the key thing is to be able to keep sending the right signals in terms of, in terms of messaging, and just keep communicating. And those who are in need of any sort of form of support, we also provide the support. There are hospitals or, or, or health institutions, I mean, owed millions of shillings by now the, uh, the, the National uh, Health Insurance Fund, yes. now, 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 now the, the Social uh, Health Authority. Hmm. They have lost faith in doing business uh, 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 with, with, with you. How do you plan to reassure them that, look, hey, that was then. We are starting a new phase on a new clean slate and we can work together. We have engaged the, the healthcare providers to the extent that we can, especially when we're running such a complicated project and we might not engage to the extent that we should because sometimes you've buried your head in, in work and getting stuff done and you need to look up once in a while to be able to carry everybody else with you. But to the extent that they can, and, and, and I want to make it clear, it is not that during this transition payments have not been being made. It's a continuous process. Hospitals mm -hmm. have been very supportive. They have continued to provide service. They have continued to receive payments. Even as of today, there's some payments that, have, that have, as they have some payments which have been released to providers. Mm -hmm. It is not enough, all right? We wish it could be more, but the only assurance we can give is all the funds that are disbursed, they will be disbursed in a fair manner. In other words, we make sure everybody gets a certain proportion of what is due to them. But again, the emphasis here is we are going to pay only genuine bills. Only, only genuine, genuine bills. bills. Yes. And the verification exercise has been completed? Well, that's what I'm saying. For the bills, it's not been completed, but you know there has been a lot of issues when it comes to bills for, for, for providers. Mm -hmm. In fact, unfortunately, in certain cases, you have had cases where people who are not doing, providing genuine service have been the first in the queue when it comes to getting paid. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying cannot continue. That cannot continue. Help me understand this. You know, you are talking about, um, you know, claims even now being paid because, I mean, you know, people are still being treated in the hospital. Yes. What safeguard measures are you, you put in place, you know, for the time that you have been in office to ensure that um, cases of fraud, you know, do not keep on piling up and piling uh, uh, the, the, the pending bills? You know, that's what I'm saying. It's, 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 we have made efforts. But you have to understand, for, number one, there's a cultural issue. This is an organization that has been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. And people will continue doing the things that they have been doing. Mm -hmm. So there's a cultural issue there. Secondly, there's a system issue. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to the digitization. 
So what we have done is to mitigate against those losses in the interim. But the long-term solution is actually transition into the new system where we've got an entirely digitized system end-to-end -end where we can be able to monitor easily and be able to know, reduce the human component, reduce aspects of discretion. But even more importantly, we don't have too many complicated packages like we had in the previous dispensation. We were running almost 100 schemes simultaneously. We're going to have one standard scheme. So where everybody, even every single Kenyan citizen, will be able to know what they're entitled to in terms of number. If we tell you you're entitled to this level of benefit, you know the amount. Nobody will deny you of it. In the past, the structure was so complicated. The contribution structure was complicated. Mm -hmm. The benefit structure was so complicated that at the end of the day, it was like a magic number you wait to be told how much have we approved for you for this procedure. That is what we want to get rid of. So now, if, for example, we say we're going to pay uh, 70000 for this type of surgery, it's the same for everybody, whether it is... The Mamboga in the street, whether it's its excellence, the president, we're going to pay 70,000. So it becomes simpler to administer. You have the mandate of turning around um, the fortunes of um, NHIF mm -hmm. and um, uh, the national health uh, uh, insurance in this country. Is it easy? Nothing good comes easy. It is not going to be an easy task. We have to start somewhere. But my the reason why I am more I can reassure Kenyans and I'm, I want to allay their fears is I keep saying it might be a very simplistic statement, but the worst case scenario I see is that we end up slightly better than we are today. You're sure? Yes. Are you fighting? Are you, are you having backlash in your efforts to turn around NHIF? To some extent, sure? and that is natural. And that is natural. How are you dealing with that? Well, you deal with it uh, in the manner it's supposed to be dealt with. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Olwene, I mean, you, 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 you're joining the public service, I mean, from the private sector, where yes. things are done differently. And there is a certain culture that you find in the public service, how yes. things are done. And, yes. And, 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 you know, the pace may yes. be different from... Yes. Is it frustrating for you? It's not frustrating. I'll say it's a learning process. Are it is coping? learning. I am coping. That's why I'm here, right? <laughs> it's a learning process. I've mm -hmm. learned a lot in this short time, especially mm -hmm. about the workings of government and how things work a little differently, right? Things are a little slower. They move a little slower. There's a little more bureaucracy. But at the end of the day, it's about being able to set systems. And the beauty about this now is we want to set a system that is going to transform our healthcare system for the next several decades. If you ask me, it's a transformative moment. It is one of this, especially the legislation that has been passed, is one of the most consequential pieces of legislation most of us are going to health legislation we will see in our time. And that's why I'm privileged to be in this position, mm -hmm. and I'm going to make sure that I do everything to make this work, so that when people look back, they say, this was a turning point. This is where we changed healthcare financing, and we made a difference for people in this country. How many legal battles are you dealing with? I can't count. In fact, at the beginning, I used to wonder. <laughs> at the beginning, I used to wonder whether I came and joined a law firm or else. <laughs> there are many. How there are, many. are they impacting? Your well, turnaround process. If you ask me, it's a double-edged sword. There are times when you have got a legal matter, and some of the issues that are raised in those legal matters actually make you think and say, okay, possibly we should have done this differently. Mm -hmm. For me, I think the legal issues are good to have in the sense that they help us be able to sort out some of those possible pitfalls we were going to fall into going later down. But it's also important because we need to carry the entire population with us. And in terms of communication, that's possibly what we've not done before. There's a lot of misconceptions. And one of the reasons that I'm here today is so that we can be able to disseminate this information and let people understand what we're trying to do. In the next week or two, you're going to see a lot of, again, communication coming out in terms of telling people what is it that we are promising? What is it that we're going to do different? Why SHA and not NHIF? What is the reason for the change? What are the benefits we have got? Why is this a better package than the other? And one thing that I know for a fact is, if you've got any the NHIF benefit package as we have them now, and everything in SHA is either at that level or better. That's why you see I made the statement earlier. We can only end up slightly better than where we were. That's the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. That is number one. But in addition to that, we've got other services like primary health care, which were not there before, which have been introduced. And we've got emergency care, which is not there, and it is mandated under the Constitution, which was not being provided. So why would somebody tell me we want to keep the state at school when there's a much better option, which has become available and looks feasible? How many people have you registered so far? At the moment we registered, as of this morning, we had about 505,000 people. How many? 505,000. 505,000. And this is before we've even gone to the media blitz in terms of being able to 
to communicate effectively about registration because we had to be sure, first of all, that our systems are stable. We have to be sure that we've got sufficient coverage because we are also trying to register people in a digital manner. And you have to be clear that you don't want to disadvantage certain people because they don't have network in the TV or internet access. So we're trying to have all these modes of registration up and running. But at the moment, these early adopters, have, we already got hundred, half, half a million people who have registered. And if you add half a million people plus their beneficiaries, you can see what numbers we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's looking, it's looking promising. We still have between now and 1st of October, we still have uh, like one and a half months plus. So that is going to be good, and we want to make this as painless as possible. And that's one of the reasons why it's taken time, because we don't want to see queues of people saying they want to register for the social health authority. And especially those who are NHIF members in the past already, we want to make it an easy way for them to be able to register as, as, as SHA members. Having the social health authority is one thing. Recruiting a new workforce is also another thing. Mm -hmm. But... Ensuring that the public, they get the services that they need, you know, it's also another thing altogether. Mm -hmm. um, are you also going to vet all the health service providers that you have to ensure that um, you re-register them or something like that? You see, we have to be clear about jurisdictional conflict because our mandate is not to register health facilities. Mm -hmm. In fact, I keep saying we're in a very precarious position because we promise people a service when we get a premium from them as a social health authority, we promise them a service which we actually can't deliver ourselves. But it's your business to empower panel. Yes, we rely on partners. Mm -hmm. So there's certain processes. First of all, registration, accreditation is the mandate of the bodies that are, and it's primarily in Kenya, the Kenya Medical Practitioner and Dentist Council. They license facilities, they register them. Mm -hmm. So what we want is a list from them and say, these are the healthcare providers. By and large, these are going to be the same providers that they've been providing service for NHIF. Then we will empanel them automatically. Empanelment means you you have got the right to play all right then at that point for us it is going to be contracted so we are telling you this is that this, this is the we need these services from you for our members this is the amount we're willing to pay for it do we have a deal then that we get contracted so that's going to be the only role that we perform but in terms of seeing that the healthcare facilities are registered and licensed that's not within our mandate so we're going to use the relevant bodies to be able to give us that information mm -hmm. same for healthcare professionals who are allowed to practice in those bodies and so on so that's not within our mandate however we're an interested party because we want our members to get quality services at the end of the day are, are, are you looking at a situation whereby you're going to re-empanel all your service providers like i said it's a new organization so everybody has to everybody be, has to. yes and that's the process, that's some of the process we're going through between now and the 1st of October. Mm -hmm. It's a new body, so it's going to be a new contract. It's a new everything. It's a new contract? Yes. Wow. I mean, if you're just joining us, we're having this good conversation here with the chairperson of the Social Health Authority. This is Dr. Timothy Olwenny. And we are looking at uh, the issues around universal health um, uh, coverage and, of course, what SHA is doing to ensure that we achieve this goal uh, by the end of this decade. I mean, we have missed in the past. So the question is, what do we need to do to accelerate this process? Uh, help us understand these, uh, 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 Dr. Timothy. Uh, the 2.75 percent, you know, deduction for salaried em em employees. Um, I, I know there has been many arguments about these, uh, but when you look at the Kenya's, you know, workforce, is this going to be enough to cater for the millions of people who are going to register with you? 2.75 percent is uh, is a number that was worked out after a lot of thought. Mm -hmm. So ideally, if it is 2.75 percent, and if we bring everybody on board, so the universality becomes real, real reality, mm -hmm. then we should be able to realize those projections. However, you must remember that contributory component is only for the social health insurance fund. These are the two are funded by the exchequer, and we're in discussions to be able to know to what extent they will be able to fund. Then we'll say these are the benefits we can be able to deliver based on the funds that are available. Mm -hmm. We are aware of the economic realities of the current moment, and we know, for example, that there's not as much money as as we had we had anticipated originally. But in terms of being fiscally responsible, we have to make sure that the scheme is sustainable. Therefore, we have got to promise what we can actually deliver. The collapse of the finance bill. Um, you know, has, 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 has led to so many financial realities that we must live, live with. And, and, you know, President William Ruto has also been at the forefront, you know, urging government institutions to tighten their belts and, and, and now live within, with, within the new realities. Um, have you been forced to drop 
you know, some of the benefits or anything like that so that you can live within a certain mean. The truth is we are reworking that benefits package. We are reworking it. All right? We are making some modifications. It might very well be that the certain benefits which we intended to, in, to administer initially might have to be phased. So we start, we start with, a lower, with a lower level of benefits and enhance it as we go along based on utilization mm -hmm. and based on availability of funds. It might very well be that some of them might be dropped completely, especially those that are not regarded as essential. Mm -hmm. But that's a discussion that we, in the next week or two, Will become very clear but one thing that i know for a fact is that any benefit that is currently being administered under the national health insurance fund is going to be maintained it's going to be maintained yes tell us something about the linda mama I mean, yes. it has been very emotive um, mm. especially with um with 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 with, with, with the public mm. uh, where are where are we are i mean i had the other day you know the government say that it has not been dropped it is going to be reworked it's going to be rejected so, so what kind of a Linda Mama are we looking at? I, I know there are also suggestions to change the name. Mm -hmm. but what kind of a concept are we looking at? If you ask me to simplify it, it's going to be Linda Mama Reloaded. It's just going to be better. But Linda Mama is going to stay. Mm -hmm. And the benefits that are there, based on the previous observations in terms of shortcomings, mm -hmm. for example, in terms of enhancing the number of visits that expectant mothers were entitled to, in terms of taking care of complications that occur around delivery, in terms of taking care of the mother and the baby after delivery, to a certain extent, for example, there's a drug called anti-D, it's an, an immune globulin, which is fairly expensive. Some mothers required it, wasn't covered before. That's what we're throwing in. Mm -hmm. So Linda Mama is going to be maintained, it is just going to be made better. The providers, on the other hand, are also going to get compensated to a higher extent than they are under the current program. So that's why I'm calling it Linda Mama Reloaded. Are you, going to re are you likely to retain the name uh, Linda Mama? If you do ask me, it is a discussion that, of course, people have had back and forth. I know in the past there's some people who had said Linda Mama, is, is, the name is going to change. But if you ask me, it's such a brand, strong brand. It elicits a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, the name should just be maintained. As we said, if it, if it ain't broken, don't, don't fix it. it. So you're okay with the Linda Mama? I'm okay with the name. Me, what I want is to deliver the it's service. Delivery. In the, fact, the service. As, for me as chair of social health authority, mm -hmm. it's not so much the name. I want to see the benefits. And at the end of the day, by the way, even for the patients, mm -hmm. if you called it Linda Mama and didn't offer the same benefits, you'd still be in trouble, isn't it? Yeah. What we want, what they want is those benefits. So for them, they're holding on to the name Linda Mama because it is associated with a certain number of, uh, a certain level of benefit. If they realize that now they're even getting those benefits and it's slightly enhanced, all the better. Linda Mama reloaded. I mean, it sounds very good. <laughs> we are coming to the end of this conversation, Dr. Yes. And I want you to f um, focus or look into that camera you know, because you'll be addressing the people that you serve. Yes. And give them hope that uh, SHA will make health services in this country much better, more professional, and more efficient. If I was to reassure the public, in, in closing, I'd like to say. We have got, we've had certain healthcare challenges within our healthcare, healthcare problems within our healthcare system, a lot of which the population are alive to. It's that we have got a lot of out-of-pocket expenditure. We've got a lot of people who cannot be able to access care. So we have got the health bills that were designed, were designed to cure a lot of the challenges that we have. So conceptually, being conceptually sound, it is conceptually sound. Mm -hmm. Those bills were passed after a lot of thought. It's conceptually sound. Then we move on to the implementation. They were signed into law. We have got a board of the Social Health Authority that was constituted with, with a lot of thought again in mind. In terms of constitution, we've got representation from the public sector and from the private sector. We have got a lot of professionals. We have got interested, interested stakeholder groups. We have got the Council of Governors is represented, the CEC Health Caucus is represented, we have got court represented, we have got the informal sector, we have got the Kenya Medical Association, we have got the PS in the Ministry of Health, the PS in the, in, from Treasury and so on and so forth. So the constitution of that board, and for the first time, if you were to ask me, we've already got four, five doctors within our board, and possibly it's going to increase to six. Mm -hmm. You've got a chairman who is a medical doctor for the first time in a long time. Yeah. And someone, like you say, who was there in the past and understands the problems that are there in this sector. And that's the reason why I'm here. The execution is going to be disciplined. I have said we have got to start this at some point, and the time to start it is now. This is the window of opportunity which we can't let pass. And I've said worst case scenario will end up slightly better than we were before we started. So I want to allay those anxieties and I think we need to give this opportunity, get, take this opportunity to try and transform our healthcare system into something that is much better than it was before. Very thank good. you. I don't want to add anything else. Dr. Ali, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Inside Government and of course for your reassuring words. We wish you all the best.
in the execution of our universal health coverage. Thank you. Asante sana. Okay. Dr. Timothy Orweni is uh, the uh, chairperson of the Social Health Authority joining us here on Inside Government to give us an update on where they are. And of course he has done that. My name is O'Brien Kimani. Thank you very much indeed for your time. You have been watching Inside Government. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.